All right. Uh, I have uh, 10 o'clock. Um, according to uh, my SL viewer, um, I'm not sure. Maybe a few people are still arriving, so uh, we might uh, wait a minute or two to uh, allow people to arrive and uh, find a seat. Um, and while we're doing that, I want to um, make sure to acknowledge uh, Delia uh, Lake. Um, Linda Kelly, uh, she created this environment for us. Um, some of you, I think, uh, uh, maybe attended last month her, uh, her walkthrough presentation of this build. And, um, uh, you know, it's fantastic. It's a real uh, treasure for Second Life education. And um, uh, we're uh, really grateful to uh, be able to have this uh, unique uh, build and unique setting for today's presentation. So, um, so thanks very much, Linda. This is fantastic. So, uh, what do you think? Uh, we're ready to call uh, call this uh, to order. Fire away, Matt. Okay, that's all I needed. <laughs> all right. So, uh, welcome everyone uh, to today's uh, Science Circle event. Um, uh, as many of you know, this is um, uh, one of a series of panel discussions um, sponsored by the Science Circle. Uh, the Science Circle is a, a, a grant funded nonprofit organization to um, uh, develop um, virtual world platforms for education. Um, so, just want to remind everyone to um, it'll be on your best behavior, uh, <laughs> uh, so that uh, we don't have any issues with our grant funding. Um, and uh, welcome to everyone to uh, today's um, uh, panel discussion, uh, where our topic today is going to be global fires. As you all know, especially last year, um, the the um, the, the scale of uh, gigantic fires all around the world um, was very shocking to people, I think, um, in Australia and in California, and then also in the Amazon of Brazil. Um, and I thought it would be uh, worthwhile to uh, take a deep dive into what might be going on about that. So I have a very special um, uh, collection of panelists uh, with us today. Uh, we have uh, Delia Lake, who is uh, Linda Kelly, and she created this environment that we're meeting in today um, and uh, did a fantastic job. It's a really stunning environment. We also have with us uh, Wordsmith Jarvanen, uh, Keith Grant, and then also special guest Dolly Waverider, uh, Chris Lincoln, uh, who has experience as a firefighter. So I think we're going to have um, uh, a nice uh, collection of different points of view about the uh, global wildfire situation uh, with this panel. And then I myself am going to give a brief presentation also. I actually have prepared remarks, even though I usually speak extemporaneously. <laughs> Uh, today, I actually have prepared remarks, and I'm going to open up uh, this event uh, with a an overview of what the heck is going on in the Amazon. Um, um, so, uh, I'm just going to get right into that. Um, you can see behind me, um, the slide behind me um, is a sort of satellite image of the Amazon region. 
Um, it's a map of the Amazon rainforest ecoregions as delineated in white. So I have a little pointer here so you can see the white here. Uh, that's the uh, rainforest uh, ecosystem. And then in blue is the Amazon drainage basin, right? And the um, nine countries share the Amazon basin. Most of the rainforest, 60% is contained in Brazil with eight other countries, including Peru, Bolivia, Colombia, Venezuela, Guiana, Suriname, French Guiana, and Ecuador, also sharing portions of the Amazon basin. The Amazon River traverses the jungle from Peru to the Atlantic Ocean. It is the largest river by discharge volume of water in the world, and by most accepted definitions, is the second longest river in the world after the Nile. And you can just see the density of that jungle, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. More than 56% so the, the Amazon jungle, weirdly enough, is fertilized by dust. More than 56% of the dust fertilizing the Amazon rainforest comes from the Baudelaire Depression in northern Chad in the Sahara Desert of Africa. The dust contains phosphorus, important for plant growth. The yearly Sahara dust replaces the equivalent amount of phosphorus washed away yearly in Amazon soil from rains and floods. NASA's Calypso satellite has measured the amount of dust transported by wind from the Sahara to the Amazon, an average of 182 million tons of dust are wind blown out of the Sahara each year. Almost 30 tons of dust fall on the Amazon basin, 22 million tons of it consisting of Deforestation is the conversion of forested areas to non-forested areas. The main source of deforestation in the Amazon are human settlement and development of the land. In 2018, about 17% of the Amazon rainforest was already destroyed. Research suggests that upon reaching about 20 to 25%, so that's only like 3 to 8% more, the tipping point to flip it to a non-forest ecosystem, degraded savanna, such as uh, 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 such as in the eastern, southern, and central Amazonia, will be reached. So here you can see the areas of deforestation. That I'm sort of highlighting here. You can see it's quite a patchwork. So. Um, Prior to the 1960s, access to the forest interior was highly restricted, and the forest remained basically intact. Farms established during the 1960s were based on crop cultivation and slash and burn method. However, colonists were unable to manage their fields and the crops, <clears throat> excuse me, colonists were unable to manage their fields and the crops because of the loss of soil fertility and weed invasion. And this is actually pretty common with jungles, is that the nutrients, the soil nutrients in jungles is very thin um, and, is, and is easily lost when the, uh, um, uh, through deforestation. The, the, the top soil is very, very thin. The soils in the Amazon are productive for only just a short period of time. The so farmers are constantly moving to new areas and clearing more land. These farming practices led to deforestation and caused extensive environmental damage. Deforestation is considerable and um, areas cleared of forest are visible to the naked eye from outer space. I have a picture of you. In the 1970s, construction began on the Trans-Amazonian Highway. This highway represented a major threat to the Amazon forest. The highway still has not been completed limiting environmental damage. I'll just add a personal note here. I lived in Brazil uh, in the 1970s when I was a teenager as an exchange student. And um, 
And the talk when I was there um, about the trans Amazonian Highway, I thought was very illustrative of how Brazilians viewed the Amazon. And I'm not sure it's still true, but in those days, Brazilians viewed the Amazon jungle as just a sort of force of nature that could not be tamed. Um, and sort of the ongoing, like, so they kind of, so that sort of led them to feel like, like the, the Amazon jungle was like, it couldn't be damaged. Um, you know, the ongoing joke or, or belief in those days was as they tried to build the trans Amazonian highway, they could only work on the highway during certain times of the year when it wasn't raining or whatever. And when they would go back to restart work on the highway, the jungle had, had overgrown and taken over the work they did during the previous period. And so the work on the highway was, um, was very frustrating for them. And just sort of reinforce this idea that the Amazon jungle just can't be tamed. Like it's just, you can't harm it. It's just a powerful force of nature on its own. And I think that this belief that the Amazon jungle um, is just impenetrable to damage uh, sort of has contributed to what we saw happen last year. So, what did happen? There were 73,000 fires in Brazil in 2019, with more than half uh, within the Amazon region. In August of 2019, there were a record 26,000 fires, the highest number in a decade. Deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon rose more than 88% in June 2019 compared with the same month in 2018, widespread blazes provoked an international outcry that Brazil was not doing enough to protect its forests. So here you can see we have another satellite image and I'll sort of point out different areas of fire all over the place, over here, over here, here, and so forth. The Brazilian Minister of the Environment tweeted that the fires are driven by dry weather, wind, and heat, but experts disagree. Quote, the blazes are surging in a pattern typical of forest clearing along the edges of the agricultural frontier, Science Magazine reported. This de deforestation has been encouraged in turn by Bolsonaro, the new Brazilian president, who has repeatedly said the Amazon should be open for business, for mining, logging, and agricultural purposes. President Emmanuel Macron of France called for urgent actions to be taken on the fires, rapidly becoming embroiled in a war of words with Brazil's right-wing president, Jair Bolsonaro. Macron accuses Mr. Bolsonaro of lying to world leaders about Brazil's commitment to preserving the environment, Mr. Bolsonaro at one point insulted Mr. Macron's wife and said he would only accept $20 million in aid offered by a group of seven nations if the French withdrew its quote unquote insults. So, um, um, but this isn't just about one rogue head of state. To get to the underlying forces of much of the world's deforestation from the lush Amazonian rainforest or the carbon-rich peatlands in Indonesia, also, by the way, which have a similar problem, you need to follow the money. Who is profiting from the development that led to these fires? Earlier this year, US-based uh, nonprofit Amazon Watch which has worked closely with indigenous groups in South America for 20 years, published an analysis showing that foreign investors have enormous influence over what happens in the Brazilian Amazon. Big banks and large investment companies play a critical role, providing billions of dollars in lending, underwriting, and equity investment. 
These investors have helped stoke the growth of the beef and soy industry in Brazil. Irresponsibly and inexorably, regardless of their intention, putting the Amazon in the crosshairs of agribusiness. In recent years, Brazil has emerged as one of the world's largest exporters of beef and soy. Brazil accounts for roughly 20% of, excuse me, um, of the global beef export market. Together, Brazil and its nearest rival, the United States, account for 83% of the global soy export. Its biggest markets are found in the uh, EU and China. As trade wars intensify between the United States and China, observers worry that demand for these Brazilian products will only grow. Cattle ranching accounts for 80% of rainforest destruction in Brazil, according to Yale School of Forestry. As the soy export market grows, so does demand for land to grow the commodity, another key driver of deforestation. Also, <clears throat> excuse me, according to the Intercepts, Ryan Grimm, Blackstone has been a major force behind huge agribusiness and infrastructure projects in Brazil, including a controversial highway and a major port, all in the former rainforest areas and all to expand agribusiness and export markets. Blackstone has also launched two funds dedicated to buying farmland in Brazil and other South American countries. BlackRock CEO Larry Fink has exalted the quote-unquote significant opportunities for investors in Brazil. And after Bolsonaro's election, he announced the expansion of BlackRock's operations in the country. Keep in mind, this is a regime that has openly celebrated the country's two-decade-long military dictatorship as called the land defenders, quote-unquote, terrorists, and lamented ecological land protection that, quote-unquote, hindered development. France and a group of Brazilian states, this is as of December 2019, so about four months ago, France and a group of Brazilian states plan to announce a partnership to preserve the Amazon rainforest, bypassing Brazil's federal government after a spat between the president of, presidents of the two countries that I referred to before. The end. That is the end of my rant about the Amazon and uh, the complicated um, political and economic forces that are contributing to the deforestation and burning of the jungle. So, with that said, let me review if we have any comments here, any questions. Yeah, uh, Wordsmith points out it's the tragedy of the commons. Um, I think that's a fair assessment. Um, uh, if everyone believes that they own it, then nobody owns it in a sense, and people do what they want. Um, and um, just to reinforce it, I do think that there's a sense of sort of indestructibility uh, of the Amazon jungle. Um, because it is, um, it is just considered uh, just a powerful force of nature in and of itself, and that this contributes to a sort of cavalier attitude toward towards its protections. Well, uh, uh, Sizji, I'm afraid I don't really know too much about the details of this arrangement that France has made with these. Uh, with the governors of the states of Brazil. Um, I don't know that um, that the plan has really been um, made public in detail. I think it's still, um, I mean, I think it's more aspirational, to be honest, than it is a concrete plan at this point. So we'll see. <clears throat> Uh, yes, exactly. They're bypassing Bolsonaro 
who is being um, uh, intransigent uh, in his negotiations, and they're going directly to sort of uh, local uh, local leaders. That's right. And um, Delia comments that uh, the coastal rainforest in Chile is also under attack. And in fact, why don't we move along? Because uh, um, don't, we have a lot to cover today. Um, so Delia, if you're prepared, um, uh, go ahead and uh, give us your presentation. Uh, let me know if you would like me to operate the slides or whether you want to do that yourself. Thank you. We'll see if I can move the slides or not. Um, I, when I thought about this, I thought um, that it's important to know the scientific information for sure, but to connect this, the fire maelstroms, the um, global wildfires to Human experience, I think, is also very important. So I kind of took that approach here. Um, and one of the things that I have done when doing this build and also preparing slides is listen to a piece of music that I have put into the one of the signs here. Um, and it is of it is cold Missouri waters, but what it is is a song about Wag Dodge, who was a smoke jumper, a firefighter in the um, Man Gulch um, fire in Montana near Missoula in August of 1949. And I think, to me anyway, that sets the uh, the feeling of how how sad and visceral some of this is. Um, so while we have heard a lot about the fires in the Amazon, the fires are really all over the world. And let's see if I can move this here. Yeah. So most recently we heard about Australia. Uh, and the build right here is based on Australia, but it is not entirely Australia. And one of the areas, let's see if I can do this, where there was an extreme um, amount of loss is down here. Like, ah, I got the green spot there. That's uh, that's Kangaroo Island, where the um, all of the koalas were burned out. Um, but if you look at the NASA uh, image here, you see fires all along the coast. So why would that happen? There's always fire in Australia. There has been, but it's seasonal, and it's bush seasonal bushfires. Um, the habitats in Australia have evolved to be dependent on fire. So, for instance, the uh, eucalyptus regnans only will seed if they have uh, fires. But the fires this past year, this year and recent years, have been much, much uh, more intense than before. So the ones in New South Wales along the coast there where you see all those red spots uh, started in coastal mountains and threatened the coastal cities. So you probably all saw pictures of the, um, the people huddled on the beaches. They had to leave their houses and spend days on the beach. Not expected. 
But one of the things that you didn't hear about was the rainforest, the uh, Gondwana rainforest. It's just inland a bit. Um, and that's one of the most ancient ecosystems on Earth. And it was burned. Um, it's the first time that in recorded history that that area has burned. And it is home to many, many rare species. So take a look at these later and explore some of these things, uh, because no presentation can do this justice. Then we have California. Uh, California also has always had fires, but the last couple of seasons have been very intense. Um, human development has destroyed a lot of the wilderness as the populations increase. Um, but it used to be that there was a more predictable dry season and wet season. And so you could depend on the fires going out. And they probably weren't in somebody's yard anyway. That's not true now. All along the entire state of California, you have fires that are burning down residential areas or evacuating residential areas. And this past February, was the driest month on record for the state of California. And uh, Dolly, do you want to add anything here about the uh, fires in California? Well, just let me mention that um, primarily I am, uh, I, f I fight fires on a barrier beach island, uh, and my fires are house fires, and my main concern is extension of a fire from one house to another. So I don't have specific experience fighting firefighters, fi uh, forest fires rather. Um, however, I'll just mention a few of the topics. I think you've touched on some of them. <clears throat> there is a history of fires. Fire is normal. Uh, clearly, the fires have been getting more extreme. Um, one of the reasons, I mean, there's lots of different reasons why, why that might be happening. But one of the factors has been and fires in the past have been stopped. Uh, and so there's a lot more fire load, which means fuel, which means a lot more forest that's contiguous without having uh, sort of random burns here and there, which might stop a fire from extending to be a larger fire. So there's actually environmentalists on both sides of the issue of whether or not you should protect all of the forest, or maybe you should ma manage the forest and harvest strips through it, or in some way to make it less contiguous, so that fires are at least contained naturally. Uh, so that's one topic. Uh, another topic is, <clears throat> I can grab my, my idea. Uh, the, the other topic was related to infrastructure in that uh, part of the uh, some of the California fires have been blamed on electrical wires uh, and that's due to the insulation being lost in the electrical wires that's something I actually experience in my own community where the electric utilities they they're pretty good at maintaining the electricity but they're not so good at maintaining the insulation on the wires that go through the community and so therefore, any time a branch falls on, a, on, on a, a wire or pushes two wires together, a secondary or a primary wire uh, or a neutral wire, then creating a short, short circuit, then sparks fly. And those sparks that fly then fall to the ground and tend to start fires. Uh, and if they burn through the wire, then the wire itself falls down and it tends to start a fire. So what's the problem here? It's a much more general problem in that long ago we used to over-engineer all of our infrastructure. Uh, and over time we've gotten more and more economical and people are awarded for being more economical, which means that there's much less headroom for failure uh, for all kinds of infrastructure, bridges, electric systems, 
water systems in Michigan. Um, so that is an issue. And so, so from the point of view of these California files, fires, I think, I think uh, we have to be aware that the, I think the electrical infrastructure needs to be revisited and somebody, some serious people have need to look at what's to be done to refurbish uh, it. That's my story. It may, not, it may not be obvious to you looking at the picture, but look at it closely here. Because that photo there of the campfire, Paradise, California, that's a house burning. Wow. That is a house burning. And so here's before and after. Paradise Estates. before a community where people lived, a young community. It's only incorporated in, I think, 1979. 25,000 people lived in this area. So then the picture to the other side is after the fire. There is nothing there. There is nothing there. So, uh, I guess in a sense, you can say that Mother Nature has reclaimed this area. Well, we heard a lot about the Amazon fires. At the same time, there were fires in uh, Central Africa, and particularly in the Democratic Republic of Congo and Angola, but all there along uh, in Central Africa. Um, that's different than some of the other places in that they are still doing slash and burn agriculture. Um, they're also uh, beginning to be more and more of the um, of the logging, particularly in the um, palm oil. So it's a different kind of a place. And most of the fires are either set by people or they are li um, lightning strikes. But it is rainforest bordered by savanna. Um, well, it's the uh, Amazon had just under 3,000 fires at the same time the DRC had 6,900 fires. And Angola had 30, almost 4,000 fires. So all of this, we've got to think about if it's happening everywhere in the world, what is the future here? And this is what it looks like when it's just forest and savanna. And what it looks like when it gets burned out. It's not just the places that we typically think of as warm. But it is also um, places that we typically think of as cold. So we had fires in the Arctic. We've had fires in the Arctic for a number of years now. Um, and there's always some fires in the Arctic, but it uh, typically has been frigid winters and cool summers. Not anymore. We've had the highest Arctic temperatures um, in the summer that have ever been recorded. Yeah, and, and speaking of smoke, I should have mentioned when we were talking back in Australia, that the smoke was blowing across to um, to New Zealand and landing on the glaciers there, and now they're saying that it's likely 
that they are going to be melting the glaciers in uh, New Zealand. So the Arctic wildfires are all around the um, all around the entire Arctic. So what difference does this make? I mean, it's not very much inhabited by people. Um, so you have the boreal forests and the uh, taiga and peat burning. Um, but it changes the whole composition of the, of the forests as they grow back. Um, and one of the factors that we don't understand well, what the consequences will be is if we have um, burned the peat, when does that stop burning? I mean, there have been underground coal fires that have burned for decades. Will that happen um, here in the Arctic? Will it be melting um, permafrost all year round? Uh, what about the release of methane? We simply don't know at this point. Um, but what we do know is that the old normal is no longer operating. So I think we have to consider here what is the new normal? Are the mega fires around the world going to be our new normal? And how are we as humans going to live with this? And how are we going to um, figure out whether our actions, how our actions influence this and what can we stop? So I think there's a lot of work to do. Um, and I really, really encourage people to look at this seriously and uh, look at the policies, look at the, um, the ways that things have changed over the, the decades and what our responsibility is moving forward. But for me, these are points of discussion, not so much as fact. And I want to emphasize that again and again, that we don't know. Um, and the more that we keep these things uh, top of mind, the more that we're aware of what we're doing, um, the more likely we are to be able to find some solutions in, in the future. Yeah, in, people are men mentioning Centralia. Um, so I have some personal experience with that in that I went to college in the middle of Pennsylvania. I went to Bucknell University and uh, going from New York to Bucknell, I would go through Centralia. And I can tell you that the first time it was very, very frightening because the roads would steam. Uh, so, that's been burning a very long time, yes. Um, and it's, you can smell it. I can still smell it to this day, what it, it's like there. Uh, but anyway, I hope that we're sparking some conversation among people here. I think, to me, that's a very, very important piece. Um, and Keith, I'm going to turn it on to you to talk about some of the changes in climate that have uh, been factors in the megafires. Okay, thank you, Tony. Yeah, uh, please, uh, let's, uh, Keith, uh, um, well, uh, yeah, let's uh, move, move along, please, uh, please proceed. I'll... Okay, um, we've heard sort of the, the on the ground, and I'm not, uh, don't have anything that duplicates what you said on the Amazon uh, Matt, I actually looked at uh, 
southern Africa, California, Australia, and, and the Arctic. And the conditions for fire um, behind all this are high temperatures. We get those from higher temperatures from climate change, uh, dry conditions, drought, uh, which there's a relation. There's a tie in there. And, uh, fuel on the ground and an ignition source, which in many cases is lightning for people. So, Southern Africa, um, we have an enhanced, El Ni an enhanced El Nino because of climate change, higher temperatures, and the El Nino in the winter between um, December and February is what this plot represents. Um, causes, um, it's a wave effect. So the El Nino is off the coast of Peru, but it causes drought in um, South Africa. And so a good part of the drought is the years there's an El Nino in here, it's warmer in here, and that um, prevents the rain in Congo. And when you have that over several years, um, that November to February is the rainy season there. It's all connected. So California two slides in California, um, and I'm very familiar with it because I live in the Bay Area. But you can see in this picture this high um, here off the coast of California, high meaning high pressure. And what it's doing is directing these storms up into Washington. So California is a Mediterranean climate. It only gets rain generally between November and April. So if this high builds in and is persistent, all the rain goes somewhere else. In California, um, the Sierra snowpack, which California depends on for water the rest of the year, um, doesn't occur. Now, along with that is by fall, uh, a high pressure forms over the Great Basin in uh, Nevada, and air flows down out of the Sierra. And as it comes down from high altitude to lower altitude, it compresses and heats. And so we get this hot, dry offshore flow in California. It's sort of the one time of the year um, that you can laugh that San Francisco doesn't have air conditioners that, because it's normally very nice and suddenly their temperature rises up. Um, in the south, these are known as the Santa Anas. In the north, they're known as the uh, Diablos. Um, so you, if you mix in the lack of rainfall and the lack of snowpack in the Sierra because of the um, blocking high combined with this offshore shore flow, hot, dry in October, you've got the perfect situation for fires. All you need is fuel on the ground and some source of ignition, which could be lightning or um, high tension power lines. There's also um, an effect of climate change, but the temperature gradient between the tropics and the um, Arctic lessens with global warming because the Arctic heats about two and a half times faster than the uh, um, lower latitudes. And that weakens the jet stream and causes it to meander more, which also ties in with the um, Arctic fires. Um, in Australia, there's the temperature effect of global warming. So we're getting higher temperatures. 
What's also gone on is the Indian dipole, which is an ocean oscillation between warmer in the east and warmer in the west. And when it's warmer in the west, um, it's colder in the east. And that um, tends to inhibit the rainfall in Australia. Um, coupled with that is the um, semi-annual mode, which is the sort of roaring foray winds, which have been pushed a little bit to the south. One thing I was looking at said they had to be called the, the roaring 43s now. And that also means that um, the rain goes elsewhere. The storms go elsewhere and don't come onto the coast of Australia. So it's a complex combination of higher temperatures from global warming um, synchronous in the last couple of years with the Indian Ocean dipole and the southern annular mode going south. The migration of the southern annular mode also um, affects at the southern Africa because it pushes the storms um, south of Africa. And finally, in the Arctic, we have the jet streams, which I mentioned with global warming become weaker and more meandering. Um, this also can produce really cold temperatures in um, uh, the mid-continent, mid-U.S. continent in the winter because Arctic air comes down. But it also means the winds um, and storms are less vigorous in the Arctic, and you don't get the precipitation. So um, Alaska, for instance, has had a severe drought. Um, it's been described as walking up there on the ground is crunchy rather than soft and mossy. You couple that with lightning and um, the peat deposits, which get ignited and are dry and just keep smoldering and burning. And that's it. All right. Very good. Uh, 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 thanks so much, Keith. Um, uh, uh, thanks to all to my panelists today. Uh, really appreciate your presentations. Um, Dolly, uh, Keith, do you have any additional comments you'd like to share with us to kind of react to what's been presented? Or do you feel, uh, um, <laughs> have, you, have you said your piece already? Um, As um, Elias said, it's a new reality, and um, one of the factors that's changing is the amount of resources, the, the expenditure that it requires to fight fires, um, which has been getting diverted from trying to maintain forests and uh, bushlands and prevent fires. Let, let me let me uh, also mention something that I'll put in chat, but I didn't mention here, um, and that's uh, we're all very well aware of the Amazon rainforest. It's a major cause, as, as is the Central African rainforest. Um, however, there is a temperate forest that's just south of the Amazon, which uh, most of us are not aware of because it's it gets no press whatsoever. It's a fairly large, in fact, I think it's the largest temperate forest in the southern hemisphere. Um, and it's being cut down at an alarming rate. <laughs> um, and you can just zoom in on uh, Google Maps, or if you really want to see the history of it on Google Earth, 
And what you'll see is a whole bunch of rectangles turning from dark green to light green. Huge, huge tracks of forest uh, being clear cut. Uh, and, and but there are, I mean, there's some ecological um, awareness in that they're leaving small corridors of uh, forest so that an, uh, you know local animals can at least transport between areas. But um, it's it's just alarming how fast it's happening, going unnoticed at the same time. And. Uh, yeah, it's very sobering. What, what's the name of that region again? Uh, well, it's uh, it escaped me right now. But right. on your original on your original slide, if you can put that that up, I'm not sure if you can. Let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. I can scroll back. I think. Mm -hmm. and basically, it's the southernmost point. It's at the juncture of Chile, Brazil, and Paraguay. On the Paraguay, mostly on the Paraguay side, but not just in Paraguay. And instead of being that sort of patchwork that you have that sort of follows rivers, okay, right at that that lower point, yeah. just to just to the east of there. All right. Huge tracts, just you know, <laughs> just an awful lot of forest disappearing very quickly. And they're not burning it. It's being done very methodically. Oh, they're not burning it? It's, it's, they're just cutting it down? Yeah. I mean, but lots of it. <laughs> I mean, like, like a, a well into two-digit percentage of, of all of Paraguay. <laughs> it's just re remarkable. And I just, I just stumbled upon it by accident when I was looking at the Amazon rainforest. Oh. So we're looking at like here, okay. Um, uh, well, yeah, I think there's a huge demand for South American woods, uh, like a global demand for it. So that yeah. probably is a, a, a little uh, bit of, and could be yeah. deciduous forest, so it could be high quality hardwoods. So uh, Vic mentions the Fos de Iguazu, which is a um, spectacular, spectacular. Uh, waterfall system, um, I think, at the uh, at the border of uh, Brazil and Chile. I think um, one of the one of the true wonders of the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, Delia remarks in local chat: in Australia and Tasmania, they cut the eucalyptus uh, regnans uh, temperate rainforest for to toilet paper. And Taglard mentions all the rosewood trees are being harvested ASAP by Chinese interests in Africa, too. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I thought, uh, you know, I was thinking, well, maybe we should try to cheer things up by having a little discussion about what poss what the possible solutions are. But I it just doesn't feel like there are any. It just feels like these the economic forces that work around the globe, not to mention um, uh, climate change and other factors are just it just uh, it just feels like a problem that we just uh, can't wrap our arms around. But I think that one of the things that we need to do is to seriously look at how our lifestyles um, are impacting these things. So that, for instance, uh, back to California, when we are um, wanting to get out of the more uh, densely populated areas and we are now encroaching into the, the wilderness areas, um, it may be beautiful, but we are also making it so that humans are um, because of the way we built and because of what Dolly was saying about 
how we've built and the infrastructure, um, we're making it more likely that we're going to have the the larger fires, uh, not the seasonal fires that are have always been around. So, um, and do we really need to cut down the eucalyptus, eucalyptus regions for toilet paper or for um, crates for, that just get tossed away? So I think part of what we is important for us is to rethink how we are doing some of the things that we're doing. That is an outstanding point. Um, I think, especially in uh, in the rich developed nations, uh, I think it just feels like uh, inevitable that there has to be at least some flattening um, of economic growth um, uh, to uh, moderate our lifestyles. Um, and I think I, I think we uh, mentioned here in the science circle recently um, that. Uh, there are being proposed sort of um, economic models uh, alternative to capitalism um, that, or, or maybe not, or maybe more tweaks of capitalism, but that uh, utilize more sustainable um, economic models uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an effort to, you know, I mean, at least there is a discussion, I think, especially going on among academics and economists. Um, to, to address that exact issue of how to basically uh, not have to rely on constant economic growth to maintain the global economy. There has to be a way that you can flatten economic growth, you know, still have a comfortable lifestyle, but do it in a more sustainable way. Um, it's, uh, it does seem that uh, it seems like a, a crucial element of the problem is that um, global capitalism now um, is dependent on constant growth. Um, you have to constantly be expanding markets. And this uh, results in the waste of resources. Um, well, one of the things that I and other, many other people have written about is uh, decoupling growth from exploitation of resources so that um, if your economic growth is dependent more on intellectual property rather than uh, exploiting virgin natural resources, you have a, a different base for growth. And the other thing here is that we reward um, extraction and exploitation, and we do not reward recycling, reuse, repurposing, all of the things that would decrease the amount of natural resources that we need to use. Right. Um, uh, I, you know, I'm not sure how optimistic to be about. This seems like a long-term project. Um, you know, I am kind of also. Uh, but there was some discussion, local chat, also about uh, the uh, coronavirus pandemic and its effect on the um, uh, on the environment. Um, I think uh, Syzygy mentioned that China's carbon emissions have dropped by 25 percent uh, due to the slowdown of its economy from coronavirus. Um, and I I kind of feel like um, due to climate change. We, this is like coronavirus may be just the leading indicator that the future may hold in store for us additional novel infectious agents that because of climate change, you know, now have an hospitable environment. So we could see that more and more. So, so the, the combined forces of pandemics and climate change may force the issue on us. I mean, it may, we may not be able to plan for this. Um, the, you know, uh, capitalism uh, may, may be forced to reckon with what is happening to the planet. And um, 
uh, Keith, the wordsmith mentions in local chat, capitalism has tended uh, to push the cost of externals, not including costs foisted on others who gain no benefit from a, an activity. Yes, that's the whole issue of, of, of externalities where uh, the costs of economic activity are pushed onto the public, whereas the benefits are of economic activity are kept private. Um, and this is a huge flaw. I mean, there are efforts to try to um, to bring externalities into economic models through taxation, for example, um, but it's patchwork and it's not systematic um, uh, and it's still too easy to game the system that way, but, but to push costs onto the public. And, and right now we do that throughout the entire supply chain, right from the beginning of extraction through to the end of life of any product. Uh, all right. Well, uh, I think we're at the top of the hour, and I think some people uh, need to uh, get along. I know that the um, uh, VWBP is also going on, so I don't want to keep people here too long. Um, let's see. We have one last comment from Tagline, the current best coping strategy of capitalism is to have great concentration of wealth and string everyone else along for the hopes of similar uh, luck. Um, yeah, I am a little bit disturbed by uh, this sort of um, privatization of, uh, you know, especially with the corona pandemic, that solutions to it are being developed by private concerns, like, for example, out of Silicon Valley. Um, and, uh, you know, it's kind of a libertarian wet dream a little bit, pardon my French, but... Um, uh, but this, you know, it's being seized upon uh, by uh, certain interest groups uh, as a way to really try to, to diminish the public's role through government to um, to address these matters. So, um, so that is another complicating factor. So, uh, so with that comment, uh, I'll, I'm going to gavel this panel to a close. Really appreciate everyone who could attend. Uh, we had a really good attendance today, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, uh, it took me a long time to assemble this great panel uh, that we had with us today, uh, so I really appreciate uh, the good attendance. Uh, have a great weekend, everyone. Enjoy your uh, VWBPE and your weekend and your quarantine. And with that, good night.